What exactly is the state of nature? That is a question usually answered by social contract theorists like Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, or even John Locke. But the most complex and intriguing discussion on the state of nature comes from Hobbes' book, Leviathan, which offers a deeply pessimistic view on human nature when there is a lack of a central political authority or a sovereign. In this state of nature, where there is no sovereign, societies fragment. Thus, there is no place for industry because the fruit thereof is uncertain and consequentially no culture of the earth, no navigation, no use of the commodities that may be exported by sea. There is a continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. The state of nature is not necessarily thought of as an actual state of war, or even a historical device which explains the foundations of societies as we know them, but as a thought experiment that can be just as relevant in the event of sectarian violence and civil war. To Hobbes, the sovereign is an arbitrator of morality and judgment. They resolve disputes between their subjects to ensure that mutual trust is enforced within the population. In the state of nature, the human condition would disallow such covenants and contracts to come to fruition, because human beings would have a heightened sense of paranoia when engaging with others. A prime example that Hobbes introduced on the state of nature would be the way of life of the American Indian, which both lacked a central authority and was highly nomadic. An example would be a verbal agreement between two men regarding the trade of fish. The problem that Hobbes poses is that each man would often think to themselves, what enforces this person to keep their word on this agreement? What would stop them from simply betraying me? Such paranoia could lead to a preemptive attack on the other party should the man feel suspicious of their intentions. This is what makes the state of nature so dangerous to Hobbes. Humans are irrational beings who are needy and vulnerable. Another important point Hobbes makes about the state of nature is that all actions are perfectly legitimate. Since there is no central authority to arbitrate disputes or the morality of the realm, men often seek it to themselves to find their own judgment. If one person thinks that killing the other will ensure their self-preservation, then they are entitled to do that in the state of nature. This also demonstrates Hobbes' obsession with the idea that self-preservation from death is of the utmost importance to human beings. Your soul is mine. He even goes on to say that people have the right to disobey a sovereign if it threatens their self-preservation. But wouldn't that dispute the absolutist authority that a sovereign should possess? This seems to discredit Hobbes' theory, at least partially. The idea of the desire for self-preservation didn't actually start with Hobbes, but with the Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius. However, it may have been reinforced by Hobbes' own views of the violent English Civil War. The experiences of this time gave Hobbes the impression that life would be better if we simply obeyed our sovereign, as long as they maintained order in the realm. This brings us to the question of how sovereigns came to be. If humans are so irrational, it seems quite improbable that any covenant based on mutual recognition could be achieved. Sovereignty by institution. Thus, Hobbes wrote that it was likely that the first sovereigns came to be through the use of coercion, known as sovereignty by acquisition. And this is somehow reinforced by Francis Fukuyama's theories on how civilizations came about in Egypt and Mesopotamia. As stated above, this is perfectly legitimate to Hobbes' eyes insofar the sovereign maintained the order of the realm. The state of nature, as described by Hobbes, need not be individualistic. Hobbes recognized that familial units were possible given the relationship between mother and child. However, these units based on kinship were sparse and still lacked a sovereign that would be able to create society. One could even take it one step further and treat sovereign nations as being engaged in a state of nature, a macrocosm of the human state of nature. This seems eerily similar to the international relations theory known as realism. 
Hobbes philosophy seems to go eye to eye with that of Francis Fukuyama, as mentioned before, who argues that humans have always been social animals. However, the danger of this rebuttal seems to fade when we analyze the familial units that are introduced in Hobbes' writing. The biggest dissident to this pessimistic view of man comes from the likes of John Locke, who believed the state of nature as being preferred. Liberties matter more than safety through absolute authority. Jean-Jacques Rousseau went even further by positing that man loves one another in the state of nature, and that government inevitably corrupts that relationship. However, he immediately contradicts himself by introducing the collectivist mentality of the general will, and the fact that he treats man as a noble savage that is solitary like a lone ape. Hobbes can be noted for his controversy, however he offers us fabulous insight on how strikingly different moral ideas between two parties can foment into civil war, anarchy, or even international war. There is an element of moral relativism even within societies which causes this civil insurrection. It shows that the state of nature is constantly looming around us and is not something that is simply left to the remote and distant past. Your soul is mine.